How's life, buddy? Everything good? No, it's good. Um, yeah. It's good. Thanks for uh, sorting this. I reckon we'll go all right. Mate, it'll be good. It'll be good. I've um, so I've, I've I know you've been listening to some of them, but I've kind of tried to do them as like a show at the start, and then okay, like when I was talking to Kane, I was like trying to interview him, and then at the end of it, we just talked like we yeah. would like Kane and I would normally, and that was like the best part of it. Yeah, yeah. So, well, it's like, because yeah. I don't know, in like that construct, you can't help but craft your answer as opposed to just being natural. And I suppose that's the, that's the growth of what makes a good interviewer is that yeah. their ability to actually listen to an answer, not wait for the next, wait for the pause so they can ask the next question. Well, yeah, that's right. Like, um, like when I was talking to Kieran Reid, I was fucking shitting myself. I'm like, what Rita. the fuck? <laughs> yeah, what the fuck? I'm, t- I'm talking to a 120 test all black captain, and I'm like, fuck, do I talk too much? Do I not talk? Like, obviously, that, do you know what I mean? Yeah. So it was just, but, but the, like, the main advice I got is just be yourself and, you um, know, it'll, it'll yeah. either work or it won't. So. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and that, like, that's it. It's, um, it is kind of facilitating, like, you've got a guest on for a reason. I'm not yeah. saying what I'm going to say is any good. I don't know what I'm going to say, but you know, yeah. it's you've you've invited a guest on for a reason. So you, your job is to kind of make them comfortable to then glean out the good stuff. Mate, well, that's right. Like I probably should have told you we've already started rolling. Just, like how I treat it is, if you and I are having a beer at the pub, yeah, that's how that's how I'm doing it. Like, right. Yeah. So I mean, I'll we'll go wherever you want to go. And, um, Sweet, buddy. Yeah, Let's hopefully make some good, insightful. Mate, uh, and if it doesn't, I get to talk to you. So it's going to be That's a good right. yeah, it's been no a nice matter day, what. Anyway. It's been a nice Monday. <laughs> Not my typical Monday talking to Duncan. Let's start, hey, let's start when we first met. Did you play to that CHS carnival at Camden, <laughs> didn't you? I did. I did, Duncan. Yeah. We, yes. I, I, can't I, was imagine th- got... I was trying to think when um, the first time we came across each other. Um, yeah, so we probably didn't meet till CHS, but I remember looking at so, – because we played you guys, um, Mid-North Coast, and, you know, a few guys in that game that would go on to be, good, you know, quite good friends. And uh, I think Kane Doug was playing, uh, Geordie McGregor, Micah, guys like that. I remember I remember looking up and like a, like one of my only carries for the whole year probably. And I've gone, like, who is this skinny fucking tall guy in the centres? I'm, <laughs> I'm going to run over him. And then all of a sudden I've driven back five metres and sat on my ass. So that was the first, that was my first impression of you. And that, I think you were in year 11, weren't you? Uh, yep. In, yeah, Camden, I would have been. Um, I do remember an extremely uh, hairy, large 18-year-old <laughs> Trying to run at me a fair bit, and that must have been you, Duncan. So, mate, I'd be surprised if you did remember. <laughs> Just remember because remarkably you smashed unremarkable. Me. Yeah, that, that's right. But we then we then went on to play CHS, and didn't I, I'm just trying to recall. We beat GPS that year, and they had guys like Kirtley, Peter Beatham. Is is that right? Am I am I remembering yeah. that right? Yeah, that's right. They were a pretty handy side. I think um, Super as well. Awful Super Tamakia. It was in that side. GPS. Um, yeah, I mean, there was when you, whenever you're playing against uh, you know Kirtley, it's um, it's going to be a pretty it's going to be a pretty good game. And you know they were pretty stacked. And um, yeah, I think we did well. We did well. I think time. I remember the the celebr- I think we won that game. And- like the celebrations when you're 17 or 18 and still at school, it's like, oh, you know, <laughs> let's go out for pizza or something. But <laughs> but remember your schoolboys, the Australian schoolboys year. So I, I I can remember it really clearly. Didn't you get – you got player of the tournament that year, didn't you? Uh, yep. Yeah. In, um, yeah, so when I was in year 11 playing uh, in that, the Opens Australian Championship, um, had a good yeah. Rose Carnival and um, – Played well, then played schoolboys that year in year eleven. I didn't didn't play much in the test. I, I was I was on the bench a fair bit that in my year eleven year, um, yeah. and then you know in my year twelve year uh, went on and, and played again, um, and uh, yeah we had, we had a pretty handy side. When did you get signed by the Tars? Uh, yeah, probably post that post that carnival. So, so the um, the year in year eleven. 
Yeah, yeah. So I signed, I signed a deal there. Um, and then, so how, how did that work? Did did I just contact you and go, "We'd like to hold you until you're old enough"? Or, um, well, I suppose the conversations had started, um, and it was just you know academy deals. So it wasn't um, you know looking yeah. back at the time, I probably, I probably uh, undercut my myself a fair bit. You don't really know as a young player your true market value and. Um, I suppose that just takes time in the game. The longer you're around, the more you understand that side of things. But look, it was, um, you know, it was, it was an opportunity that um, to, to be involved with, with New South Wales. And I'd, um, you know, from, I'd played all juniors for New South Wales. I was very proud to, to wear that jersey. So the, the opportunity to, you know, maybe one day wear that professionally um, was presented. And I, and I absolutely took that. Uh, with both hands and I was you know pretty surprised and not long after that actually um, playing for the side so did you have any other people come to you with opportunities at that time or was it just the task yeah um, I suppose in those um, in those national championship carnivals there's you know there's plenty of plenty of uh, you know all the super rugby clubs will have you know representatives there and um, you know I know NRL clubs also send out um, you know, they're kind of player development guys to, to watch and look at um, and as well a fair few player agents too. So you'd be silly not to be there looking at that, that next crop coming through. And um, yeah, so I, I, I played rugby um, on a Saturday in league on a Sunday, um, you know, up until about the under-16s where it's kind of the under-16s, you're almost men. So it's hard to... You know, they make you make a decision. Hey? Yeah, you, yeah, you got you got to make a call and... Look, I enjoyed both games, um, but I kind of felt at the time I was probably a better rugby player than I was, you know, junior league player, and um, yeah, and went from there. So, so you, you did year twelve. Did you train with the Tars at all that year, or was it just no, school? No, no, no. So in year twelve, because I, uh, as yourself, you know, we went through the CHS system, so um, you know, our schools didn't have you know a rugby program, etc. So. Uh, at the time, so I was using, um, you know, my local club, Southern Districts. So I was playing Colts um, in year 11 and year 12, sort of on and off between the, the representative schoolboy stuff, um, which was great, which was awesome for my uh, development as a, as a player and a young, you know, as a young man, essentially being 16, 17 years old, playing under 21s, um, you know, that felt like a big step up. Uh, and, you know, in saying that too, then playing schoolboys was almost like, well, now I'm just playing guys my own age. It, that that was, um, I think that really helped me um, with yeah. public confidence. And then, you know, before, I, you know, the next year I was, well, as soon as I pens down HSC, I was then pre-season Moritz. So I was training against and amongst men. So that helped that um, that step up and progression. Were you because you had this already lined up after school? Did it affect how you um, went at school in terms of your studies? Um, I, I mean, I I was I enjoyed I enjoyed school because you know I got to got to hang around your mates all day and and um, you know learn learn new things which I which I enjoyed. I, I was. Um, you know, pretty academic and I enjoyed that side of things and also enjoyed the, you know, the, the mateship, friendship and, and sport too. So um, I enjoyed school and it's, uh, it definitely didn't take away. If anything, I was kind of, once you make these representative sides, you're in rugby, you tour and you spend time with them and you're all going through the same studies, etc. So you're kind of exposed to different people and different uh, the, the different ways that they're going about it. And I think that actually helped me in that yeah. um, I was exposed to guys, you know, at the, at the GPS schools, the, the private schools, which um, have a bit of support around the academic stuff and, you know, just how they were approaching it. That was, that was good. That was a good kind of, um, uh, I don't know, insight into what other people, um, how much work they're putting into, into their study too. So, um, no, I think it actually benefited me to, to be exposed to, to people from different you know, aspects of life and, and how they were going about their studies. So, um, no, and it, it's, uh, if anything, I think it, it helped. Okay, that's, that's interesting. Talk, talk to me about your first day of the task. 
how are you can you remember how you felt walking in yep um <laughs> i just i just it was surreal like it was totally surreal and the first person i saw um was tamana tahu um, because he had just signed from rugby league um that year to come to the waratahs and and so we were both there like birth, both first day um both there early to do your medicals or whatever um i'll come in and just go on that's tamana tahu <laughs> um so that was uh uh, you know, it's just pretty surreal. And then too, you know, you're walking the halls past Lottie Takiri and, you know, Phil War and um, just all these wallabies that have, that have been at the top of the game for so long. Um, it was, it, yeah, it just felt like, wow. Uh, you're just, you know, you're kind of just at training. You, you're not really training. You're kind of just watching these guys. Like you're, yeah. you're getting a pass from, you know, from um, from someone, you go, wow, I've just got to pass from him. And then you, you're passing someone else, go, wow, I've just passed. <laughs> you, you have those kind of pinch yourself moments. Uh, and you're just doing your best. You're not really thinking. You're just trying to hold your own. Um, Did you, game, how was the training? Respect. How was the training for you? Like, was it a bit of a step, step up compared to what you were used to? Oh, well, yeah. Because I, I, you know, what was I training? I was training two nights a week type thing. Um, yeah. And to go into a full, Full professional training program the load was immense and and surprise not surprisingly my body broke down um because i wasn't ready for the running loads i wasn't ready for the you know the the weightlifting etc the the loads in the gym and um so even though i was uh i felt you know somewhat comfortable on the field um i suppose all the physical aspects of it I just, my body wasn't mature enough to, to deal with it. And so I had a few, um, I suppose, a bit of a stop start, uh, start to my career with soft tissue, soft tissue injuries, largely because of, of that. Yeah. Were you, were you full, were you full contract then or did you start on like a? No, nah, so, uh, yeah, so I was, um, uh, what they called it at the time, professional academy. So I was training full time with the main squad, but I was in, I suppose, that, that second tier group. Yeah. Um, my first year. And then, you know, once I played a handful of games, that activated a, a you know, full standard contract. So you, you played pretty quickly, didn't you? I did. I was, uh, so I think I debuted um, in round four. Uh, so that's, so when I was left school, um, you know, say whatever, you know, October, November, you, you finish your HSC exams, pens down, then straight into pre season training. Um, I you know, ducked away for a week for schoolies, but then came back um, about five kilos lighter, which wasn't great. But <laughs> I didn't didn't need to lose five kilos, done. <laughs> um, but uh, no, then then played a couple of trial games. Um, went away with the sevens. Played a tournament with the sevens. Um, then played some you know academy games, and there were a few a few injuries in the centres. And you know you know at the time, you and Mackenzie didn't need to didn't have to pick me. He had options, um, but he gave me the opportunity and. Um, and went from there. So, yeah, played played pretty quickly. Did, looking back on it, do you think you were ready for it? Uh, no. <laughs> no, no way. It's, um, I mean, yeah, I'm I'm of the I'm a firm believer of if you're good enough, you're old enough. Um, yeah. I absolutely believe that. And um, you know, you're not going to hold guys like freak talents like Curtly or, or Quaid. You know, even Christian. You know, these guys are. A generational talents that you just don't you need them to be exposed to the highest level to then take the licks early and to progress but I suppose you know not being a playmaker and the way I played the game was probably more based on um, physicality and, and I love that side of the game um, you know also having you know some uh, I suppose knowing the right times um, you know, to make defensive reads, et cetera, and to be able to, to make those reads also. There's a bit goes into that. But, you know, I was, I was more of a physical player, not a, you know, a skill-based player. So for, for me, um, you know, debuting at 18 as a physical player um, in the centres, I was, I, was I was pretty light. I wasn't that um, – I wasn't the size, I suppose, to be able to back – the the approach um, I took to the game and yeah unfortunately I got a few soft tissue injuries um, just 
through the back of that, just increased load and um, backing up week to week in, in a professional you know, competition. Um, that broke me down. But I suppose, um, you know, it is kind of, it, it's Darwinism at its, at its best elite sport. You kind of, you know, survival of the, the fittest. And um, if, so was I too young to, to play or was it too early? I feel like I would have been a better player if I'd, um, if I'd debuted, you know, when I was, I don't know, maybe 23, 24, 25, just because my maturity level around the game would have been better. And yeah. therefore I would have been able to apply both the understanding of technically um, the maturity level towards the game and also physically. Um, so you've, you, you had to learn all that stuff at the highest level, really. Yep, yep. Uh, but I was—I mean, I was fortunate. I was—I was surrounded by a um, a very uh, experienced Waratahs squad, particularly in the forward pack. It was it was a very, you know, when I when I started in two thousand eight, it was our pack was the strength of the side, and and the back line was quite quite young, talented, but but young. Um, so I suppose having that uh, a game plan which was more forward orientated, um, it wasn't as as a harder landing as it could have been. Um, so, how long did it take you to feel comfortable, or where you can kind of go, "Oh, I belong here"? Um, yeah, good question. I think it. You probably you. You never feel comfortable. Right? You, you never every day. You, you're always questioning yourself, and you're always, you know, competing against your teammates. Um, you know, so. I think you, you probably don't get to, to be in the room unless you are like that to an extent, uh, unless you are always questioning yourself in the sense that I need to be better. I need to be better than I was, you know, last week, yesterday, today, um, just to stay still. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. So I think, look, there's a moment in, in every player's career, and, and I know I felt it, where you're – the all the the planets align in that physically you're at your optimum um you're technically you you feel confident in your skill set and then and then third your your maturity and mindset around how you feel um about your role the team the game plan the strategy um your opposition so when those three things meet and i think it kind of for, for backs, I think it's that kind of 25, 26, 27. Like that's when you really, all those three things come together and you, you're typically fine. You're going to be playing some, some good football. What about the mental side of it from, how old were you when you made your debut? 20? For Australia? No, no, for, for, for New South Wales. Uh, 18. So what about the mental side of it? Were you... Did you like as an eighteen-year-old man? You're probably not going to go looking for for help with the mental side of it. Probably particularly back then. But but how did you deal with it? Did you have any coping mechanisms? Did you talk to people, mentors? Um, no, I mean I was. Look, I wish I, I wish I had um, had that you know person to go to type thing, um, but I didn't. And I guess I when you're that young you're just doing you're not thinking you're just doing your best and you're just trying you're, you're sprinting a you're just sprinting a marathon right you're just doing you're doing yeah. your absolute best and then um then it kind of comes the the hard part where it's no this is actually this is what you're doing this is how you're doing it um and that's so that's maybe after kind of two seasons where it's all shiny and new um then you know the grind comes in and then how you deal with the grind, which is very much a part of professional sport. Um, that's a really tricky part. Um, but for how, you know, for me, the playing the game, like it wasn't, I love playing the game. I found it hard early on the training because everyone picks up a footy to play the game. You don't pick it up to, to train. So I, it took me a while to understand that, no, you actually have to put in, the same intensity, the same application every day to training to then get the output of a good performance on the weekend. 
So yeah. it took me, it took me a long time to even just accept within myself that training, you, you have to enjoy it because you do it far more than you play the game. Absolutely. And so early on, I really resisted it. I was just like, oh, I'll just get me through this so I can play. Like the best day of the week is a Saturday. Um, yeah. So that, that took me a lot. That first part of my career was, was um, a real, I suppose, tussle within myself to just understand that and then accept it. And once I, I got it, once the penny dropped, then, geez, it's, it's not a bad existence. It's a pretty good lifestyle. Absolutely. Were you part of the 20, was it 2014 they won the title? Were you in that team? Yep. Yeah, it was. Um, that was, yeah, that was a special ride. It was pretty, um, pretty remarkable, you know, with, uh, with an underperforming kind of um, perennial underachieving squad that's um, chock full of talent that just never could, could do it. We could always, we'd always make the finals. <laughs> Don't worry about that. We'd make the, we'd make the finals, but um, we'd never win it. So, you know, and we, we played the game a way that you would get to finals, but you certainly wouldn't win it. So um, I suppose having, you know, Michael Checker come in and his, um, and just his complete overhaul of, of the organisation um, and the playing, just the, the playing group, it was, uh, it was a pretty, pretty special ride from, from the previous 2013 um, into the to 14, uh, winning the comp, um, and then 15 too. So it was, yeah, the plenty plenty of lessons learned. And um, is there any is there any moment that stands out when you look back on that year? Um, oh. On field, on field or off field? Oh, mate, it was. Uh, I think I look back to 2013. So. Check came in and just completely um, just broke the squad down in every aspect, just overloaded us because we were, when you watch the, looked at the data, when you watch the video, um, we were not a hardworking team at all. So he, all we did that first year, it was just, it was like the, the kickboxer kicking the, kicking the, um, the stump on the tree, the shin, just keep kicking it, keep kicking it. Um, and eventually your shin hardens up and you can, you know, you, you're, as, you're as tough as the tree. So that's what we did. We just, just really physically, um, you know, bashed each other every day and um, we worked hard and we we're the fittest we ever, we ever were. And you know what, the, the outcomes on the weekend, that was, that was not the big picture. Um, even though you obviously, you know, you, every time you, you go out in the field, you want to win, but there are times where, it was it was going to be difficult for us to win just for the amount of work we were doing through the week, and you know that's testament to a, to having a long term strategy, not just hey I need to win this weekend so I keep my job as a coach. It was he was kind of looking down the track. Definitely, yeah. definitely. Um, yeah, you know, I, I distinctly remember one um, you know one one Friday morning, and we we're. We're doing a, I don't know, you know, the captain's run. I don't know whoever invented the captain's run, but um, we're doing a the captain's biggest run. waste of time ever. <laughs> we're doing a captain's <laughs> run, and you know, we're just as you do, you just cruise around, and you know, you jog through some plays, and um, you talk about what you're going to do, etc. And uh, he just blew up Deluxe, saying, you know, what do you think this is? We're just going to walk around all day, or so he said. Um, we're at Moore Park there on the outside field and go, boys, you've got your GPS in. You need to sprint around this 400-meter AFL field. Um, we've got your data, live data going. If anyone's not running at their you know, maximum capacity, um, we're going again and again and again. So you've got these blokes that have turned up to just you know, pass a footy walk around on that day, the day before you're playing a game. And we are absolutely herring around this AFL field as hard as you can possibly go because you know if you're not going as hard as you go, you you know, big brother's watching in the GPS unit and you're back again. Um, so that was just an example, a bit of, I suppose, an insight into, um, you know what, we're, we're changing things and we're going to have to change to get the result we're after. Tell me about getting picked to play for Australia. Did it come, did it come out of the blue for you or were you one of those guys that was in the squad for a little, a little bit before you actually got a game? Um, yeah, I think, look, I was... Uh, I had a few, I had, I had a few um, hamstring injuries, and um, that probably 
you know, it feels funny to say, but maybe delayed um, my introduction into just the squad. Um, so I did, I, I did debut at 20 um, for Australia, which is, um, you know, I'm very proud of to be able to, to be able to have played for Australia just, you know, just once, but, you know, I was lucky enough to play, I think 35 times for, for my country. And um, I debuted uh, for the Wallabies in Canberra against Fiji. And I don't remember too much of it because I copped a Fiji and, Stray elbow to the head, which, yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, it was, you know, it was just, it was a special moment, um, just because it's something that every every kid that's picked up a rugby ball would ever dream of pulling on the gold jersey, and um, you know, I cherished it from um, from being able to wear that jersey you know, for the schoolboys, and then to for the, the under twenties as well, playing two years of the twenties, and then also um, for for the Wallabies. How did they tell you you were going to be in the team? Uh, I think it was a call. I just got a phone call, yeah, from um, Robbie Deans at the time as a coach and, um, and said I was in the squad and, and there you go. And it's the first day of school all, all over again. <laughs> what, was it, what was it like? So obviously you've been around a lot of the Tars Wallabies, but was it a similar feeling again at walk into a Wallabies camp or were you a bit more comfortable because you knew some of the guys? No, it's uh, just very, very nervous, you know, because again, you've just, you've spent time earning the respect of your teammates at your club or your state. And then, you know, it's, it's a whole nother thing to go into a, to a national setup. And then again, you don't really know these guys who played against them, but you got to, as a, I suppose, as a, as a player, you, you want the respect of your teammates before you can ever think of, you know, earning the respect of opposition. So, um, every day you just, everyone is out there to perform their best to, to you know, one, make the team um, and be in that match day, match day 15 or 23. But um, I think at the, at the core of every team is to earn the respect of your teammates because yeah. when it matters, particularly in test footy, you know, test footy is just a different beast altogether. It's so physical. And if you want to be in the trenches with someone, you've got to, you've got to have that person's respect and your ability to play the game. Who, who was around your back line at that time? Yeah, so we were pretty, pretty young. It was, it was almost like our Australian under-20s kind of, um, kind of back line. So, you know, obviously with a few, few old heads um, around. But, look, it was um, – I feel like, you know, I was part of a, a, a – there was a, a group of, I suppose, Australian schoolboys teams that came through 2005, 6, 7 that then that – core kind of went on to to form the the backbone of the Wallabies for I suppose my kind of playing time and I look back in you know I look back in somewhat of regret in that we just never really fulfilled our potential as a playing group um, it was just so talented and it's uh it's looking back you, you do feel like you know what well, yeah we won there was you know we won a couple of super rugby competitions being the Reds in 2011 and and us in 14 um, but geez, we could have done more in that um, in that national setup. Like when you've got you've got a generational player like you know David Pocock, um, you've got you know Will Gagne, right. Quade Curtly, Cooper, Curtly Bill. Bill. Yeah. Um, you know, it's uh, it was it was a pretty pretty special group that came through. So yeah, looking back. Um, I do feel like we, we never really achieved the, the heights that we should have as a group. Which World Cup did you play at? Uh, so I played uh, 2011 um, in New Zealand and uh, 2015 in England. So, oh, no, so I forgot you played in the 2011 one. I thought it was just the 2015 one. What, what are your memories of that? Of which one? They're very Both. different. Yeah, um, well, tell me, tell me about 2011. I uh, look... World Cups are hard. They're really hard. They're a slog. Like they are, um, you're away for, you're, you're in this, you know, bubble environment, World Cup um, environment for two months. And uh, so particularly in New Zealand where it's, uh, when you were on a collision, co collision course with each other and um, it was, you know, at that time, New Zealand had never, they'd always um, had that, had that monkey on the back where they hadn't won since 87. Um, you know, uh, 
yeah, 2003, obviously, you know, in Australia, um, we beat them in the semi, then um, seven in France, we both bombed out in the quarters and it was kind of 2011 and um, we'd beat them in um, like a transiated tri-nations type tournament pre, um, pre-World Cup. And it's, uh, it was, it was intense. Um, and I think the lessons learned was for me, uh, being a young player, having gone to my first World Cup, um, I was on the bench in that semi-final against New Zealand um, at, at Eden Park. And then to come on, uh, I think I came on about the 65th minute um, and just to experience, because in the lead up, all the commentary, you know, not, not within, within the team environment, but kind of the outside noise was that, you know, New Zealand are, they can't do it. Like they haven't done it. Um, now they're at home. They've had all this pressure piled onto them. How are they going to deal with this pressure? Um, and then what I experienced on the field was I had never experienced playing against a side that were just completely 15 men on the same page, on the same mission, doing the same thing with complete and utter dogged focus. Um, because when you play against sides, it's, you're often just playing, you know, there's a couple of good players and, you know, you, you're, looking, you're looking out for them and there's, the game goes in ebbs and flows. But, yeah, the, just the, the, the energy I kind of felt from an opposition was I kind of went, um, I went, oh, wow, that's what it, you know, we, the, we went on to, to lose that game, but, you know, we really weren't in it. And um, the lesson I learned was that that's what it takes to win a World Cup, you know. They Are you? The, Sorry. I was gonna, they, they couldn't have had more pressure on them to go out there and do it. And, you know, and what I experienced was a team that did it and uh, that was, you know what, that's what it takes. It's, it just yeah, right. takes that absolute dogged focus to be in the moment to get a result like that. So um, you, could feel, you could feel that when you were playing against them? Oh, yeah, definitely. And that's the first time I ever, you know, had felt that type of energy from an opposition ever um, and ever since, to be honest. Are you the kind of guy that, that looks back and goes, holy shit, I played in a World Cup semi-final and two World Cups? Or do you look back with a little bit of, you know, I don't like using the word regret, but what could have been, maybe? Uh, no. Or a, bit of bo- or a bit of both, No, because... Uh, uh, I think 20, 2015 was hard um, from a from two cents from a from an individual point of view. I um, yeah, it was a it was an incredible ride. Again, it was just a great moment. We had so much momentum, and we um, we played so many games out of Twickenham, and we had um, it, it was almost like our second home ground type thing because we all our pool games were in the pool of death with with host nation England, Wales, who were playing well. Um, you know, a good Fiji inside with plenty of, um, you know, foreign-based French players in it. And, um, yeah, so it, uh, it was just an incredible ride to, to beat England at Twickenham in their home World Cup. And, um, but unfortunately, I did my shoulder, um, dislocated my shoulder, and, and I worked hard to, to be in a position to be selected in the, um, in the knockout rounds of the World Cup. And, um, you know, I was nowhere near fit or anything like that but I was pretty it was I was pretty determined to um to make a good showing of it uh I wasn't selected um but I suppose to be part of to be still part of the squad the training days etc leading up to um you know a, a world cup final where which um you know that's I suppose that was the the difficult part where you know we didn't win um we felt like we were going to win in every ounce and bone in our body just because of just that belief that we had in, in the squad and ourselves. And um, so it was hard from an individual point of view in that I wasn't on the field and as yeah. a player, you want to be able to impact a result and I wasn't on the field. Um, and then two, I just, I couldn't have felt um, more that we, we, that was our time. Um, to yeah. do it, to get it done, um, and we didn't. So that was so that was um, that was hard. But do I have regret? No, like not at all. No way. Um, and that's why I 
helped me make the decision to to leave Australian rugby and to go play to go play in England because I felt comfortable with what I'd done in Australian rugby and what I what I had done in um, in New South Wales jersey in Australian jersey. I was comfortable. I'd spent ten years um, in the game here, and I was ready for to experience the, I suppose the other things that rugby has to offer around the world. And we haven't got too much more time. I've, I've got to ask you about Northampton. Tell me, tell me about the, the experience of the place. How did you find it? You know, yeah. what memories of it? Yeah, I, I loved my time at, at Northampton. It was, um, it's, uh, you know, for, for those that have been there or experienced it, it's a pretty, it's a very, it's a rugby town. It's a working class town. And I guess the way I played the game in a very, I suppose, physical sense, um, that um, the the Northampton, you know, I suppose, crowd and, and supporters uh, embraced that style that style of game. So, um, you know, I was uh, involved in you know the, the community. It's a small it's a small town, so you kind of you walk down the street and um, everyone knows each other. And it's just I, it was really nourishing for me coming from um, a Super Rugby experience in a in a sporting market where in Sydney it, there's, you know, eight rugby league teams, you know, two A league teams. It's there's professional sport coming out your ear. There's, there's AFL cricket, AFL, yeah. right? Yeah. So it's, um, you know, coming from that environment um, to what you know what is a professional environment to um, English club rugby, which is essentially club rugby just with resources, um, was an incredible experience for me, and it just brought out it just brought out the best in me. And I felt um, I felt at really ho- at home playing for Northampton, um, uh, just because I did get that nourishment where it was very very um, tangible the community attachment to the team. You know they they. They ride it on the outcomes of, of the team on the weekend, and um, and yeah, and so uh, unfortunately, you know that um, I was, yeah, I planned on being there for. I'd, I'd signed a three-year deal. I was going to be there for three years, um, and, and and possibly more, but um, that wasn't meant to be. And uh, in the end, I um, I suffered my injury kind of at the the back end of um, that first season. So uh, I wanted to. Without going into details on the injury, I think that's been reasonably well publicised. What about your mindset around it? That that's what I'm more interested in. How did you how did you cope with it? How how do you cope with it? Yeah, um, yeah. I suppose for those that, that don't know, I've suffered um, a brachial plexus avulsion. Uh, so I've detached the five nerves from my spinal cord. So I can't, um, I've got limb paralysis in my right arm. Um, and so, yeah, it's, uh, I suppose I, I retired on the field um, that, that moment. Um, and, you know, it was, it was clearly a very, uh, it was a challenging period of time. Um, but yeah, going back to the, the Northampton community and um, that was, I feel it was, it's strange and you think that well I'm if it was to happen anywhere um like I'm glad it happened there in a sense because I felt I felt a connection to the club anyway and then and it was kind of um it was it it showed itself in just the overwhelming support that I felt back post that injury um I I remember seeing photos of you testimonial game and that must have been some some experience for you yeah yeah well to start with you know I was I was given the opportunity to to captain the club um and which I it was the gravity of that situation wasn't lost on me that I was you know I wasn't I was an international player I was and you know captaining a very traditional old school English club um it's um so that meant a lot to me to captain the side and I and I wanted to do it right um and then I felt when I suffered my injury, it was, um, you know, that 
that whole next chapter I felt of my playing career had been taken away because I really felt like I could contribute to the club for a long period of time in that, in that role. But um, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's something which to be, you know, a testimonial, I suppose it wasn't a testimonial, a testimonial in the traditional sense, but in the traditional sense, if you've played 10 years at a club, you've, you are, um, you're offered the chance to have a testimonial and that's not, it's not given, it's not a right. You have to be yeah. offered it. Um, and so, you know, but just, I suppose that, it, so it wasn't a, a traditional testimonial in, in any form, but just the, the, the support from both Northampton and, um, and Leicester too um, was immense. And it's a, the rugby community is a tight knit community. Everyone knows everyone. Um, so yeah, it's, um, yeah, it meant a lot to me and, and, and to my family to be recognised in that sense. It's, uh, you know, I, I hold no, um, I hold, hold no uh, grudges or anything like that against the game because the game, the game has played such a massive role in forming and shaping the person I am today. And you know what, if I didn't go out there and, um, and play the, the game with reckless abandon like I, I tended to do, I wouldn't have been true to myself and, you know, I probably should have just retired then anyway. So you probably wouldn't have achieved what you, you achieved either, to be fair. Yep. Um, what about life after rugby? Was there a period where you just like, like, like how did you deal with it? Because it's a serious yeah. thing to happen. It's a oh, yeah, yeah. career at 30 of 27 yeah. at the time. Yep. You know, um, I mean, it's a big thing to deal with. How yeah. did you do? Yeah. Well, I think, um, to get on with it really. And whether that's the, the best way or not, um, it's, it's really the only way, because if you don't, the, the alternative is pretty, pretty grim. So yeah. you just got to get on with it. Um, you, you have to kind of close that chapter and go, okay, um, accept um, and move on and go, okay, what's next? What's my next, um, what's the next challenge? And I think we're pretty fortunate coming from a, um, from a background in in the game that that provides you with I suppose the the tools the mentality to then go okay what's next um, and I'm ready to go because you've got that inbuilt resilience and um, persistence and determination that you know if you, you're true to that it's going to lead to a good outcome so um, that's what I've applied to this um, yeah to post rugby yeah hey let's let's two more questions and I'll leave you alone yeah, mate. You're fantastic. You're fantastic at this, by the oh, way. Thanks, Duncan. I can tell you were nervous at the start. <laughs> You've done a really good job. When you look back, apart from maybe one tackle in Northampton, do you have any regrets about anything? Uh, I mean, first and foremost, I don't regret the tackle in Northampton. Um, like I said earlier, is if I didn't, if I didn't. Um, you know, go out and try and play the game the way the way I always had, then. Yeah, that's probably something was I should probably stop playing the game. Um, wouldn't have been yeah. true to myself. So I don't regret I don't regret the tackle. I I completely um, wish there was a different outcome, but um, you know, it's yeah. not the same thing. So um, is there anything I regret? You know, there was there was probably you know three or four years in my playing career, which um, really I call them the lost years. I kind of just I didn't. I didn't grow as a player. I didn't, I didn't um, certainly wasn't at my best. And I was just trying to, it was a real battle between us keeping myself healthy um, with my body and, and not breaking down to um, just to be able to do that, to get on the field. And, you know, that's no way to, uh, to be your, your peak and to play well. So I was just, I feel like there's a few years there where I was kind of, I never, I wasn't playing, wasn't playing, I was playing well enough, but not, um, you know, not to the, to the standard that you would, you would uh, want to be. I lied to you. Two more questions. When you look back, did you enjoy it? Yeah, I did. It's, uh, you know, what you enjoy, you know, obviously you enjoy the, the wins and et cetera, but you enjoy the, the mateship. It's the, it's the experiences. It's a great game because it's a global game. It's not, um, you know, it's, you pop your head out of the bubble in, in Sydney and, and in Australian rugby and you go, wow, like this game is thriving and will continue to, because it is, 
it is yeah um it's a pretty special thing once you once you get out there and you know you experience a a game at some of these stadiums around the world and um yeah so it's uh yeah what what you what you love about your time is the memories you've created and that's what it that's what you know, kind of took me a while in my career to go what you're doing here is creating memories and you're creating those memories to then share so um that's what that's what i was kind of i was playing for i was playing to one you know to to represent you know your family and and your team well and your teammates but then too to create memories so the memories you're creating are obviously the the games that the big games that you win etc the trophies and what have you but it's the memories that you know the the touring and um you know also the grind just some of the just the the crazy you know physical stuff that you've got to do as a as an athlete which god i'm glad i'm not doing that anymore so yeah, amen to that, brother. <laughs> now, last question, and I'll leave you alone, man. I'm right. so, great, so grateful for this. All good. What advice would you give 18-year-old Rob Horn? Footy, life, any direction you want to take it. Uh, God, advice. Um, That's very philosophical, Duncan. I hadn't really thought about giving my 18-year-old self advice before. And maybe it wouldn't give yourself any advice. Uh, I mean, nothing, like, to be honest, like, really honest, like, nothing springs to mind. Um, yeah. But it's, it's probably advice you would give any young person in any walk of life, and that's, that's just to, to embrace it and to enjoy whatever it is that you're doing at that time because the more you do that, the more you're going to, um, to perform the best you can at whatever it is that that may be and then therefore the next day is going to be better than the next day and the next day and before you know it, you've just, you know, you, you've gotten to a place where you'd like to be. So um, I suppose that's, that's the biggest piece of advice is the more that, you embrace and enjoy what you're doing, only good things can come of that. Mate, that's a very philosophical answer for someone. Well, there you go. <laughs> mate, let's finish on that. Let's have a beer soon. Yep, sounds good. I appreciate it a lot, mate. This will be Thank out you, next Duncan. Wednesday. Lovely. Uh, good to talk. I loved it. Awesome. Thanks, See you, mate. brother. Cheers.